Hi, good afternoon. Am I audible? Yes. So, uh, my name is Dr. Sumar. Uh, today, is, uh, I would like to share my story about how we did scaling up uh, of the social media side of one of our clients. <laughs> Oh, 
know this game is a prediction, we could go over. <laughs> he said was that the web server was something called very extra large web server from the server. And he said he got a data web server. What the client was trying to do was, they were trying to scale it vertically. We are talking a minute about the vertical and for your scale wise. The server stack that was their existing. Uh, when we took over this, the application was there. And the web application server where the Apache and what we have So, Joomla is a PHP based application. PHP is a PHP based application. Everybody is on different types of PHP. Database, so that was my student. For code, they have chosen JMS. By coincidence, they will use a date, not a scale. And the project was hosted on GitHub. Who was on GitHub? One was GitHub. So, one of the, this entire development, one set was deployed on the US world. Second one deployed in South American world. So, when we took over, the immediate and critical challenges that we found. Well, first challenge, number of operating users. Approximately as soon as the system or the traffic used to hit, say approximately 150 concrete users, it used to crash or become unresponsive. That was the first challenge. So that was the expectation of the management that the first thing that you need to do is to scale it from 150 users to say 300 users. In a way, if there are standard users on the site, it should still perform. That was the first challenge. Let me ask. Challenge number two is Joomla. As far as I know, Joomla is not very famous for its scalability part. There are various things regarding Joomla. For example, for every page request, there are corresponding 50 database calls. <laughs> that is a big challenge. Suppose if there are 1000 page views making your server page Correspondingly, maybe there would be 5000 database queries fired. That, why it is important? Because that makes scaling database a big challenge. We have spent hours and hours on uh, Joomla forums and IRC channels, talking to various uh, committee members, even the uh, project uh, maintainers of Joomla. How do we scale? <laughs> and for everybody, they have mentioned that scaling for databases, what you need to do is take it in the box. <laughs> PC to instance or whatever, we get a bigger uh, database instance. Our challenge was Varesh also. When we took over, we were just given the access to AWS account. Nothing else. No knowledge transfer, no documentation, nothing. You go, you find out, you find out where things are, how they have been set up. We don't know where the document group is, how many servers are there, how they have been set up. The thing that I am showing you is after we have found out okay, this was the setup, how it was set up. So there was no knowledge answer, nothing. Challenge 4 was the Git workflow. The Git team has came from a S3 background. So they were using Git as if they were using S3. So everybody was working on their own system, on a shared file system, and then they used to send their uh, new code to their release manager, and every evening he used to copy paste and cut all the code, and then he used to upload that code. That was the state of the project. That we saw that things are there. So I am telling you all these different aspects because when you are scaling things up, 
it is not only your servers it is not only uh, your architecture it is also your workflow processes how fast you are doing other things in the network in the entire environment and challenge fibers random routings sometimes for no reason there is no load of the server there is uh, no uh, no huge spike in traffic or no huge usage or CPU usage still the site is not running you are just getting a file screen that's it that was another challenge so the first thing that we said was to design a scalable architecture for the client now how do we do that? there are two ways to scale one is to do it vertically when I say vertical scaling, what I mean is today suppose you have a dual core processor with say 2 bits of RAM as an EC2 instance or maybe a physical server, it doesn't matter and you want to scale it up one of the ways is get a bigger box maybe get a quad core server or maybe a 8 core server with 8 bits of RAM, 16 bits of RAM with common server second is you keep on using small small instances or systems and attach them together and use them basically cluster them all so that is called as horizontal scaling so rather than having one server or for example one web server you have say five web servers and you distribute the entire traffic and workload on five different web servers so rather than having one server, one big server, you have having five servers. They are close to it. Why? Because today, if three servers go down for whatever reasons, the entire site goes down. But if I have five servers, even if one goes down, the rest of them will keep on delivering content and serving requests. So after evaluating lots of different instances in terms of uh, large instance, small instance, scale, big instance, so when we say which instance we want to use for your server, second method for that is capacity plan. How do you determine which instance we use? Whether uh, should I go with an M1 extra large, M3 extra large, or C1 extra large? Article of AWS. Yeah. How many of you have worked on AWS? Okay, so most of you would know what uh, M3 instances are, uh, C1 extra instances would be. Their configuration varies from the number of CPU cores and RAM, right. what they allocate. Okay. So it is a waste of resource of having. So let me say, uh, compare your uh, server instance to it. <laughs> so you want to go out for a big day and you go out very less often and maybe for once in a while you need a bus or a travel do you want to buy a bus rather than a car it makes sense to have a car and whenever you require just hire a bus and then take it out on a day this mechanism saves a lot of cost because the bigger instances cost more, smaller, smaller instances are less expensive. So whenever you want, you can add more instances and take them out when you don't need them. The philosophy of actually using the cloud or AWS is pay as you go. And you should only use what you need. If you are, if you are producing things extra which you really don't need, then you are basically unnecessarily wasting your money on the infrastructure and use automation so this was another design goal that you should be using automation so that we can scale up things very fast so shed is the tool that we chose why we will come to that conclusion in soon 
So as a solu- as a part of the solution, what we did was we trained the development team on how to properly use this case, how to do deep pull, push, merging, resolving conflicts. For many people, these would be some trivial things. For people who are already habituated to doing it, they might think these are nothing. One should know all these things. But for a new person who doesn't know them, or if they have come from a different background, for them, this could be bottlenecks. So we train the development team on how to use the case and the workflow. And we gave them an entire workflow that this is how we have to do the entire development process. Another thing was collect and analyze statistics. Why that is important? Because if we don't know what the current network traffic is, how much uh, CPU usage are we actually using? What are the resource usage in our systems? Till the time, how are you going to know whether my you know, my application is database intensive, CPU intensive, RAM intensive, or disk intensive? So wherever the bottlenecks are, if you don't know where the bottleneck is, how are you going to solve that problem? It is somebody coming to you saying, or if you are going to talk to yourself, I have a fever. It just gives you a medicine to get rid of the fever. But if the root cause is not solved, the fever will come back. Similarly, in the infrastructure also, if there is a problem, if you don't know the problem, if you don't realize where the bottleneck is, how will you solve it? <coughs> so for that, without talking greedily, better thing would be to collect statistics. And we did that itself. So for application performance management, we chose Neuralink, very good hosted platform for application performance management. It gives us good visibility on what our response time is, what is the server response time, what is the end user response time, what is the database response time. So at a very micro level, Neuralink gives us all those statistics. This helps us to determine whether there are bottlenecks in the system. This helps our developers realize where to improve, what code to improve, which queries to uh, which queries to optimize, and so on and so forth. We use the uh, AWS CloudWatch for getting the server statistics. What is the CPU usage, RAM usage, memory usage, etc. Central logging, very important part of the network infrastructure. If you have various servers, if you don't know what is getting logged, what is getting your server, it very becomes very difficult. Especially if you have tens and twenties of servers or thousands of servers, logging to every server via SSH or maybe putty and doing a tear on the syslog would be not a very feasible or optimal solution. And Google Analytics for getting the pattern how our user how our users are interacting with the site, which pages they were hitting most, what time of the day or within 24 hours they were actually active on the site. So with all this information in hand, we said we want to change the pattern. First thing we did was we chose NGX over Apache. There are various uh, good points of choosing NGINX rather than Apache. If you do a Google search, Apache versus NGINX, what are the plus points? Uh, you'll get a lot of it. I just mentioned one or two of them. One is it is event driven. Second, it will not keep the uh, connection open altogether. Apache will keep on having the connection open with uh, the user for everything. Then from mod PHP, we shifted to PHP FPM. So PHP FPM is a fast CGI process manager for PHP based applications. In our uh, statistics and the evaluation that we did, we saw that at the lower stack, 
you have Apache and not PHP. The better performance, if you want to get a better performance, you have to use Apache not FCGI. On top of it, you have Nginx and, FP, uh, and Nginx and mod FCGI. And the best performance for PHP applications currently is Nginx plus FPM. This is a combination. And with databases, MySQL to MyMD. Even increasing uh, your version from MySQL 5.1 to MySQL 5.5 gives you a huge uh, performance boost. <coughs> I don't have the current statistics, but I will try to publish it on my website, uh, my blog, so that uh, you can go through it. So, enter chef. So, what is chef? Uh, how many of you are already aware of chef? Show of hands. Okay. Great. So, I will not take much time on the chef part because already, you already know that. Open source platform, infrastructure as code, it can scale well and it basically accelerates the time to market, gives us consistent solution to deploy, always. Chef is a systems integration platform. What do you mean by systems integration? You have various pieces right from web servers to databases to load balancers to the provision of the servers and all those things. You take all these various pieces and you make them work together. That is basically system integration. Configuration management platform. Configuration management is take a bare metal system which has nothing but OS and maybe one or two services running. And then from there come to a state where you can deliver services that you intend to. Very simply, Chef can Chef allows us to do whatever we can do memory, we can automate. That is what Chef can do first. So if you can create any user mode of this, Chef can do that for you. If you can deploy things, uh, applications and uh, data and servers, uh, servers and services, Chef can do that for you. So one other thing is you need to tell Chef what to do, not how to do it. That is a big advantage. So if you say install a package, you don't have to tell it how to install a package. Chef is intelligent enough to know how to install that package. Alternates, alternative DevOps for platform. So one of the other funder for calling this concept is called as DevOps. Development and operations combined together, DevOps. Historically speaking, they were system admins. They were developers and they were both working in their own silos. The developers used to work on their own stuff, their features and their client requirements and all those things. And system admin was, they were working in their own silo and they had their own agenda. That was the point of content that had already been, that traditionally it has been a point of contention. System admins wants a consistent state for the system. They don't want to keep on changing the system. But for that is their objective, their goal. For developers, it is always trying to see new features. Every week, every day, you have to write new code, new features, new releases. That is a developer's life. So, new concept called as DevOps has evolved from all this. Uh, so that a person should know both development as well as operations. And how do we do it? We write a code which basically deploys our entire infrastructure consistently again and again. So how Chef works? Uh, do you want me to explain how Chef works? Please show up a hand if you want to. Okay. So what happens is uh, there is an administration, administrator's workstation. As you know, it is your laptop, my laptop. Okay. So this is my admin workstation. There is a chef server. 
it can be on cloud, it can be in your local office, somewhere, it is somewhere. So there is a shared server, there is an admin workstation, then you have your systems which you want to configure. Now your servers, they could be a virtual machine, it could be a cloud instance or it could be a physical server, it really doesn't matter to us. What I am telling to you for share or any other uh, platform, it really doesn't matter as long as it has operating system installed or if you can provision it, whether it is a physical server, virtual server or a cloud instance, it doesn't make a difference. So, we write code on the admin workstation. We upload it to our shared servers and we tell it what to do, not how to do it. And then we deploy it. So, there is a chef client that keeps on running on all the instances or all the servers where you want to deploy. So, example, I want to deploy these servers currently. So, I will create these servers. I will install chef client. I will attach them to my chef server and tell them what to do. So, I will show you uh, the state or some snippets of the code of uh, which will give you some examples. So, after lot of uh, redesigning, deployments and all these things, this is what we had, the current state. This is just one zone. Assuming that it is a US data center, on that US data center it is AWS, the region is US, inside it, it is VPC. Any idea for people what VPC is all about? How many of you know VPC is? Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to explain what VPC is? Okay. So VPC is virtual private cloud. The benefit of that is something like a virtual data center for yourself. You have your own private network, private subnet, everything is there uh, in a jail environment. Okay. So inside VPC there are availability zones. Now AWS has uh, Amazon has various data centers, uh, North Virginia, so it has US, US East 1, East 1B, uh, one 1A one and so and so forth. So as you it is one of the availability zones, East 1 or East, uh, East 1A and you have various availability zones also and these are the servers in various subnets and they have a NAT gateway through which they can interact with the internet. So what we did was we used ELB as it is and the attack that we used to hit the web servers inside. This was really relevant from a security standpoint of view because nobody could access the web servers or database servers or any servers directly at all. All these servers had private IP. So the only way to get to these servers were through an internet gateway which we had hardened and secured so that nobody unauthorized access can be granted. And this was replicated, this entire thing was replicated from US zone to South American zone also for a time. So at the end of this, we had approximately 23 servers running in total. Out of that, many web servers, many database servers, many some staging environments and so on and so forth. So uh, people who have used PHP or Joomla, uh, what do you think? How much time does it take to deploy one web server? Any idea? In the Amazon? In anyway, so if you want to deploy Joomla uh, with 5 minutes, 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 yeah, so 2-3 minutes and if you just take the normal you have to download the mm -hmm. and install it on the yeah. setup the server it's basically about whether you do your workflow or not so okay. if you do your workflow you will do it in 5 minutes yeah if you have to figure things out you can take 2 hours okay 
So now let me give you some of the steps that were involved in setting up this REST server that we are talking about. So you have to provide an EC2 instance, okay? Uh, upgrade and update the OS, install NDP. Uh, do people know what NDP is? Why do you need it? NDP is network time protocol. It is required so that your systems are running on time. If it varies differently, then you will get uh, your syslog will get screwed up and lot of other things. Install git, configure your git keys so that you can pull the source code from github. Uh, create the document group for the application for every website. Now we had three websites. So I have to create uh, different document group folders. Should I say document group or should I say just folders where you want to deploy applications? Uh, clone the applications, modify the configuration file. So I have to take uh, this entire code that the developer has written, modify the configuration so that it points to the right database servers uh, with the, the correct credentials. Then I have to file, we have to copy five different files right from the configuration file and other files specific for searching and optimization and language settings etc. So those were there, install and configure ST tools. We were keeping a uh, lot of our static files and QB data on the uh, S3 servers. Continuation. Uh, install and configure PHP. When I say configure, you know, remember it's, it's very, very small thing like increase the uh, file upload size in the php.ini and other things that is required for your application. Configure Nginx for virtual host. So you have to serve three different websites. So you have to create virtual host and uh, tell it where the document root is and how to serve those things. Configure New Relic. So all our servers have to be configured, install New Relic, configure it so that it will uh, send the data to the New Relic server for application performance management for us to get the statistics. Then uh, we used to send out of mails to uh, the end users every day. So we have to uh, use mails, configure mails. You know, it is a different story of how we deal it. We try sending mails. Amazon blocks you after a certain number of mails in a day. So then we have to use the entire uh, gateway servers, relay it through that. We apply for uh, that these are legitimate mails. Can you allow us? Amazon didn't reply. So we had to go do and work around. So if anybody is interested, I will explain you that also. Uh, set up seven cron entries for every website. That was needed. Uh, configure central logging server. So we used a service called as Logly for logging all our uh, logs centrally. So that was uh, Logly. And install and configure Monit. Any idea what Monit is? Okay. So Monit is a service uh, which can restart, monitor your services. So your uh, Apache or database or any other service, it is running. What happens if it goes down at the middle of the day? You have to wake up, somebody will wake you up and ask you to start it. Monitor is a service which keeps on continuously monitoring whether the service is alive or not. Whether it is really working or not. So it is like the supervisor D. Yes, so there are, there are, there are various uh, alternate solutions uh, for Monit, Supervisor D, uh, I think God or something like that. Very other things. So we chose Monit and we went ahead with it. So now, uh, can you imagine how much time it would take for us to deploy this entire thing? So you were doing all this before you started using Shell. No, no, uh, so if you do it manually, how long it will take? This entire set. Just on one server itself, it can be better than one. <laughs> More than that. Okay. Yeah. So, one day. Yeah. Yeah. If we had to do it manually, it used to take four hours for mm -hmm. us to get one web server up and running. That too, if everything goes smoothly. Now, people who have done server management, they know it hardly happens that things go smoothly. Or the way they are. You forget about semicolon. You forget one step in between. No matter if you are given the entire documentation also, we may take to forget. 
and then you have to troubleshoot where things have gone wrong, why it is not serving, etc. With chef, you could do it in 10 minutes. It takes approximately 5 minutes to bring a new instance up and then uh, for the deployment, another 5 minutes. That's it. So why not use auto scaling? Some of you might have that thought. Why not use auto scaling? So uh, auto scaling is a very good feature, but the diff uh, one of the difficulties our developers were consistently pushing new code every hour, every day throughout, throughout the day. So if I have to use auto scaling, what it does is basically it creates an AMI. It basically creates an image of that application and keeps it. And then whenever you want to deploy. It will just create a new instance or new image of it and deploy it. So if there is an old code on that, your entire uh, user base will be served with an old application, not with a new one. That is a drawback. Okay. Otherwise, you have to keep on uh, creating new AMI images for uh, auto scaling. And if your developers are pushing code every hour or every few hours, imagine what it will be. So uh, some few snapshots of the code. So if I have to install Postfix, which is a mail server, all I need to do is tell the chef server, write the code, package, Postfix, action, install. That's it. I am not telling it how to install Postfix. I am just telling it install Postfix. So so if it is what the domain and IP keep the domain in sentable file of Postfix. Yes, so I can do that. So this code will just install Postfix. That's it. Okay, how will we do it on an RPM based system? It will use YAM. On a Ubuntu system, it will use APT. And uh, for other systems, it will choose uh, various package managers because based on the system. You don't have to tell what to use. Chef is also available for OS X. Yes, so Chef is available for uh, Windows, Linux, AIX, Mac OS X, Solaris, now IBM, uh, other uh, system P and all those things. Also, virtually Yes, almost. Do we need uh, repositories for particular packages in the system? So either you can use your own repositories, or you can let it uh, install it from the normal repository you have. Say, if you have a local uh, repository in your office and you are installing software, so you don't want to go and get those softwares every now and then from the internet. You can point it to the local repository. The particular package is not available. Yes, so you can tell you where to go and fetch it. That is it. Very good. So here we are assuming that we have configured uh, the server to uh, go to the internet and go to the normal repository and get it. So if it is app get, so uh, if it is an Ubuntu system, it will go to Ubuntu or Ubuntu.com get the relevant package and store it. These are the templates which you are asking. How do we configure the uh, package uh, configuration file? So basically, it is uh, saying take a template and install it on slash etc postfix main.cl. That is the postfix configuration file. This one. This is the location. This is the source which is a ERP template, something like what you do with PHP. Yeah. So that, that path. May be different or different systems. Which one? For postfix. Yes, so we can specify. This is what we are writing. So we can say that rather than on slash etc postfix may not see we go to some other place. So what if I am writing something? So if I am using my uh, uh, OSX setup hmm. and uh, postfix is not available on blue, but let's make it generic. If I have used blue, the config file may be somewhere else. Yes, but right. at the same time, I want. My chef, uh, uh, what you call them, recipes. Yes. Uh, my chef recipes to be independent of this platform change when I am actually deploying on. Yes. So we, we can specify that based on platform, this is the location. Ah. So if there is some platform specific code that you want, you can say if my assume that my OS is Mac OS X, then this template should go to some other location. If it is on Ubuntu, it should go to some other location and so forth. This is what a template looks like. Uh, you can assume it like an ASP code. 
you will marry an ESP. <laughs> that is how it looks like. Even for PHP, uh, people who have uh, worked on PHP, it looks like uh, almost the same thing. So you have your variables which you have to specify, which we specify here. Like my post name, <laughs> this is basically a node dot name is a variable which will dynamically replace it once you deploy it. Mm -hmm. And here are uh, other relay host and what is the relay port, etc. To enable a service, I have to use a so this is a DSL, Ruby DSL, which specifies that I want to enable this postfix at runtime, at boot, and also uh, it should start right now. That is what that would mean. So some of the uh, issues that we have or things that we have dabbled with was RDS versus DB uh, or ECP. So we were using MySQL for scalability perspective. What we did was we dabbled with R, deploying one zone in RDS. <coughs> for one zone we used uh, EC2 instance for the hosting MySQL. And our experience has been that if you use MySQL or basically MariaDB latest version on an EC2 instance, it gives you much better performance than RDS. That has been our experience. Maybe everybody would have different experiences. Uh, we shifted from MySQL to MariaDB after it got acquired and MariaDB came into existence and they released a lot of new improvements in the code base. And horizontal scaling with Galera Tester. So we are in short of time, but if you want to know more, you can do MySQL clustering in multi-master mode and scale it up as we do with uh, web servers. So your database, you write to any of the databases, it will be replicated to all the databases without any issue. So if you want to talk to me later, I will tell you what are the pros and cons of Galera clustering. Caching. We had a very interesting issue with caching part and that wide screen of that I was talking about site going randomly down was because of one of the reasons uh, I think it was called as op, op cache. You have PHP have op cache something. So that was basically screwing up. After a lot of research and everything, we used to try to debug it, print and everything. It even still it used to go and show the wide screen. And that was the caching issue. Once you take that out of the picture, it was resolved. So we stopped using that. Uh, we chose file system cache for caching perspective. We did use memory pride and cache. And to our astonishment, my mem cache was not working as expected with Joomla. Everybody suggests use mem cache with your Joomla application to get a good performance improvement. But when we try to use memcache, it was basically degrading the entire performance. Mm -hmm. And that was because of all the memcache write queries. And for that, we have even tried to contact uh, the developers of memcache, uh, the project maintainers, <coughs> and even their builders. So maybe for such a case instance, we didn't know. Uh, we tried a lot, didn't work for us. Okay. One. Okay. Uh, it, mem cache has get request and put request. Yeah. So all the put request, which is basically write to mem cache in the memory, it was degrading, and because of that, it was taking a lot of time. Now why we really don't know. We don't have an idea. We tried a lot to check with various uh, other members in the community, couldn't find it out, figure it out yet. Uh, we tried varnish, really good, uh, really amazing uh, performance improvement. Only thing we have not put it into uh, production right now is because of the session fees. So if you want to log into the uh, site, if you just view the pages or the articles, great, it will work fine. Right. But if you log into the site and if you log out, maybe it will still show you as login. If you have logged out, even still, so uh, that was the discrepancy. So we still need to figure out that varnish session based things. Other than that, varnish is really amazing for caching purpose. Security, uh, we had this entire thing on VPC, uh, different subnets, different security groups, everything locked down. And on top of it, we were doing IP tables with the firewalls to further block the systems and only keep it off applications. 
So no way in hell could anybody get into the system, get into our systems and hack. And to manage this entire thing that we are talking about, it was done with only one person. Can you imagine? So benefits, benefits are that we achieved all high availability, uh, high stability, lot of, uh, uh, we basically scale the system to 10 times more uh, service request and 10 times more users than it was actually when we took off, when we took over the project. Learnings, it takes a lot of time and effort to do all these things. It can't be done overnight in a week or in a month. It takes trial and error, thinking out of, out, out of the box. Communication between the teams are really important. Because if your developers are not supporting you, yes, no. if you are not su supporting your developers, you will not achieve what you are uh, intending to achieve. Work as a team, really important. Questions. So uh, we are short of time. You can uh, you can take questions uh, offline. And thank you.